everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Nutrition is often top of mind for Oklahoma cattle producers, especially when it comes to grazing during the warmer months. To kick us off today, SUNUP's Curtis Hare talks with Dr. Dave Lawman about using supplements during the summer months. Well, summer's almost here, which means that's the peak time for grazing for a lot of beef producers. So Dave, as we move into these summer months, mineral supplements is always on a topic of mind for these producers. Yeah, I mean, cattle have a requirement for salt, sodium and chloride, uh, ab above all other nutrients in forage, sodium is the most deficient. And so cattle are gonna be looking for salt this time of year. So one common uh, mineral formula that's fed this time of year has around 16% salt. And if the cows aren't consuming, say, two and a half to three ounces a day, they're probably not getting quite enough salt. And so one handy little trick uh, is just to take a red Solo cup and a bag of, of feed grade salt and add about four Solo cups uh, to a 50 pound bag of mineral and that takes your concentration of 16% salt up to about 25% salt. And if they'll continue to consume around three ounces, that should get them enough salt to meet the requirements. So keeping the uh, uh, mineral supplement out is important and maybe trying to help the cattle regulate their consumption might be the other important thing this time of year. Otherwise, the concentration of, of other minerals, you know, calcium, phosphorus, the trace minerals like uh, selenium, copper, zinc, they're pretty good this time of year. So that's not as much a concern. Now it will be later in the summer as those concentrations reduce as the, or decline as the forage matures. So I think the main thing is to tr just kind of track the consumption of the mineral and if, if they're not consuming enough according to the, the label, uh, then you might want to intervene and try to in increase their intake or in some cases uh, producers may have to uh, reduce the intake. Well that was going to lead to my next question like how often do they need to be kind of to be, be, to be doing this? Well I, we, like to, we like to put out about a week's worth at a time and so that just gives you a good way you know if you have a, a schedule where you go back and check the mineral feeders as you check your cattle let's say every Monday morning uh, you, you can kind of look in there and see if it's completely gone, you know, maybe you need to put a little bit more out. If the cattle aren't consuming enough, uh, you know, a simple thing to do is maybe add a little bit more salt because if, if you've got a low salt mineral product and if that doesn't work, then you can move to something that's more palatable uh, to, to stimulate mineral intake. So how long are we talking? Is this something that just needs to kind of carry them through up until we get to fall? Throughout, throughout grazing, uh, they, they're going to, it's always going to be the forage is always going to be low in sodium. As the season progresses on native pasture in particular, phosphorus begins to decline in the forage as it matures and eventually it gets below the animal's requirement. And so uh, that the same thing can be said for the trace minerals. So one really important idea relative to uh, feeding mineral is uh, a lot of veterinarians recommend uh, providing chlorotetracycline uh, this time of year primarily for anaplasmosis control and through the summer and so producers just need to know that they need to have a conversation with their veterinarian. All right thanks Dave. Dr. Dave Lawman, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Wes Lee with another edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. The dominant weather topic for Oklahoma continues to be the cooler than normal air we have encountered. We have spent three of the last four months to date below normal. This included Tuesday's record-breaking coolest high temperatures. Temperatures struggled to climb out of the 40s in the Panhandle and out of the 50s for most of the rest of the state. The normal high temperature for the 12th of May is 20 to 30 degrees higher than what we had this week. They should be averaging close to 80 degrees. The record least maximum temperature for the 12th showed that we set a new benchmark for about a third of the locations on this map. This continued cooler weather has also correlated into cool soil temperatures as well. 
This map from Wednesday morning shows that the soil temperature under sod at the 4-inch depth ranged from 51 degrees in the Panhandle to only 63 degrees at Broken Bow. The forecast map for next week's temperatures are showing tan conditions across all of Oklahoma. This means there is a slightly better than 50-50 chance that temperatures will return to warmer than normal. Gary's up next showing the rainfall prospects for the state. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well it's certainly been a quiet spring and an even quieter May. Uh, all this cool weather has helped keep the severe weather down but it's also helped keep the rainfall down. Some parts of the state have gotten extra, some have gotten less. Let's take a look at the newest drought monitor map and then at some rainfall maps and see where we are. Well the biggest movement this week in the drought monitor map is much more abnormally dry conditions showing up in the northwestern part of the state. That's an area that has continually missed uh, the various rounds of rainfall that have come through. We have had some improvements across eastern and south central Oklahoma, a little bit down in southwest Oklahoma, but we really want to see more of that rainfall up in the northwest to prevent some more drought expansion. We can take a look at the last 30 days from the mesonet. Uh, these numbers across the southeastern half of the state look pretty good, save for southwestern Oklahoma, uh, but we see up in the northwestern part of the state, we do see those blue areas signifying less than an inch of rainfall. Now this rain looks pretty good when you just take a look at the numbers, but then you realize this is half of April and half of May, and then we realize that's not quite as good as what we're expecting during the rainy season. If we look at the deficits from the Mesnet for the same time frame, we see much of that northwestern half the state, one to more than two inches below normal. A few areas less than an inch below normal, but in large part uh, due to that missing of the uh, severe weather and thunderstorms that we've had so far this spring. Meanwhile, in the southeastern half of the state, we do see uh, lots of surplus, uh, two, three, four, even as much as seven inches above normal in some areas. Well, since it is May, we still have hope for lots of rainfall to ease some of these drought conditions. When we look at the outlook for next week from the Climate Prediction Center, we do see greatly increased odds of above normal precipitation across the entire state, but especially across the southern half. We'd rather see that a little bit more up in the northwestern part of the state, but we'll take anything we can get at this point. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Our extension entomologist, Dr. Tom Royer, joins us now. Tom, why don't we just start with an overview of, of what you're observing uh, with the wheat crop around Oklahoma? Something unusual this year. Um, one of the, the most prominent aphid that I've been getting samples on and being asked to identify is the English grain aphid. So I kind of say where the English are invading us again, but um, it's an unusual one. It's one that we don't typically see here in Oklahoma. Apparently we had the right kind of weather this year. And the unusual thing about it is that people will mistake it for a green bug when it's, you know, in, in leaves, but it likes to get into the head once that head emerges and they'll start sucking the plant juices out of the head and cause the, the head to not fill, the seed not fill properly. So it's important to go out and scout for them, look for them particularly on the head, maybe take a head and start beating it on your hand to see if they're falling out. So I, it sounds like they can be pretty detrimental, especially at this stage in the growing season. Are, what are the treatment options, if there are any, at this stage? The, they, they are controlled by any number of uh, insecticides that we recommend for aphid control in general. So it, uh, that's, not the, uh, that's not the issue. It's just making sure you get out there and find them and see if they're there. The last time we saw you, the, the topic was army worms. What's the status there? I haven't heard much about army worms, but the, the heads are out right now, and this is the time uh, when army worms can be a problem. So I would just suggest anybody, uh, as they're looking for English grain aphids, pay attention and see if there's any army worm activity too. You also have uh, some research milestones to, to talk about. Give us, give us an update. We, we've been collecting data for about the last five years. Um, and it started out just collecting yield data because I was interested in evaluating a common a farmer practice of adding an insecticide with their top dress nitrogen application in the winter time. And my idea was that originally was that I wanted to show them that it wasn't beneficial to them. It didn't pay for itself. And um, 
have to admit when you're wrong. It turns out that they really gain a, a pretty sizable increase in or protection and yield. So once I realized that that was the case, I wanted to find out why. And I think I found the answer. There's, a, there's kind of a hidden mite called the winter grain mite that I, we don't pay attention to because they're uh, in the ground and they don't come up. Um, but our, our research shows that that application will really knock them back. And that's the fun of discovery, is oh, coming up with is. possible scenarios and then it, it goes the way it's supposed to go uh, with, with the way the research is yeah, set up. I, I hate to admit when I'm wrong, <laughs> but you know, if the data says I'm wrong, then I have to admit that I'm wrong. Too, How about so. when growers hear that? Are they, they okay do they think it. it's funny? Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for sharing that with us and, and we look, to, look forward to hearing more as it progresses. Okay. Thanks a lot. So Justin, Tom and Lyndall were just talking about insects that impact a, uh, agriculture and crops. So let's talk about insects that impact people and livestock. Um, so ticks, you know, there was probably like a, uh, a thought that maybe that crazy winter storm might have like knocked ticks back for the summer, but that's probably not gonna happen. No, not, not likely because the ticks are always dependent on a, a multi-year cycle. And in fact, some of our ticks will take up to two years to develop. The thing that will impact ticks are always cold and dry or hot and dry, not necessarily extremely cold or not necessarily extremely hot if there's still moisture involved. So yes, our tick population is starting to uh, become active. We're starting to see more ticks, more multi-species of ticks. So they're out and about right now. So again, we, we talk about this every summer, but what are some things that people can do to protect themselves and their livestock when they go out in the fields? Yeah, so when we think about ticks uh, for for public health and humans, the, the biggest thing is to put some kind of product that has DEET in it, and preferably something that probably has 25% or more. Because with that, we know the research shows that when you have at least 25% DEET, it, you're, you're getting at least about two to three hours of protection. Now, when we consider livestock, livestock is a, a little bit more challenging because they're in where the ticks are more frequently than we are. And the biggest challenge with that is you don't always see a tick. First thing they need to do is bring their animals up and, and do a, uh, what we call a thorough tick scratch where we'll, we'll feel a tick before we'll see a tick. And so they need to really look in and around the brisket area of a cow or around the udders of a cow. If they're looking at any other animal like a horse, look at the jawline, look in between the horse's legs or anything like that. And then they need to get some kind of product on it. For cattle, that's usually a pour-on product, uh, whether it's like um, what we call our microcyclic lactones or other types of products. But then uh, gener generally you have to get some kind of application to where the ticks are. And, and in fact, we know that if you make a direct application, whether it's spray or whatever it is, to where the ticks are, like in what we call the between the legs and so forth, then you, you get longer protection. So in regards to like the actual like impact that ticks have on, on those animals, is it mainly just disease or does there actually like impacts for the amount of blood that they're taking out if there's a bunch of them on there? Yeah, so in general, we, we different species of ticks can impact, uh, especially cattle in different ways. When we think about this, the Lone Star tick is the one, the tick with the little white dot on it. Uh, when we, we know that when we get 10 or more of those female ticks that are engorged with blood, we see an impact to production, whether it's reduced weight performance, like weight gain, or reduced uh, milk production that turns into a weaning weight in calves. But with the Gulf Coast tick that's in the ear, it'll cause what we call a condition called gotch ear, where it's really thickening of the ear, especially in calves. And then our last tick is the American dog tick that we're really concerned on anaplasmosis uh, for, for cattle. All those ticks can be involved with uh, human disease, and so you certainly want to consider that as well. Alrighty, thanks Justin. If you'd like to link to some more information about ticks and what you can do to manage ticks around in your area, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow-Calf Corner. 
This week, we're fortunate to have Dr. Rosslyn Biggs join us, and we're going to talk about herd health programs for beef cattle. Uh, first, Dr. Biggs, why are herd health programs important? How do we go about implementing one? So the first thing you need to do with a herd health program is really kind of establish some goals. As a veterinarian, I, my first recommendation is sit down with your veterinarian, not when it's an emergency, of course, but sit down with your veterinarian and outline what are the kinds of cattle you have in your operation and what are your goals for them. That can help establish, you know, what kind of vaccination program do we need as part of that herd health? What kind of deworming uh, regimen do we need to be implementing or monitoring? What are the biosecurity practices that we need to be taking? Um, perhaps diagnostic testing needs to come into it, into it as well. So we, we want to sit down with our vet and plan accordingly. When would we want to implement a herd program? When should it start? Well, if you don't already have one, now's the time to start and have those discussions. But certainly with our breeding herds, we're a big cow-calf state. We need to revisit those plans at least annually. And the best time to do it is, in my mind, at least, at least 45 to 60 days before you're planning on that breeding season starting. And so then that gives you a little bit of lead time, make some changes. And if you are going to, for instance, as part of your herd health plan, going to vaccinate those heifers 30 days prior to, to turnout or turn, prior to breeding, we can make those changes then. Is it a one size fits all? Do my heifers, my cows, my bulls, my steer calves? Right. It, it's absolutely not one size fits all. Uh, it, it may not be the same for you and your next door neighbor uh, for both with breeding operations. And so you need to take the time, uh, visit again with your veterinarian and outline back to those goals. What are, what's the end point for these cattle? And what are you trying to achieve? What improvements are you trying to make? And how does that fit into your herd health plan? Uh, I, we have the question all the time, like just script it out for me. I, 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 it's cookbook, give it to me and, and, and I'm gonna do what you say and it's not that easy, unfortunately. Um, there are some parameters that are, are general, and but it needs to be unique to your operation. And so probably not just meet with your vet once, but remain in contact and, and think about things as we move forward in time. Absolutely. It, it's got to be a commitment by the whole team for that herd health program. Uh, we need to, in my mind, we need to have bring people that, that have the expertise, veterinarians, nutritionists, et cetera, into, into the group and, and develop that, that program together. And so uh, we wanna have those discussions and then again, make those goals and, and try to achieve them in the next year. You know, I, I think it's really critical to, to have the discussions well in advance. Don't wait for emergencies. Um, build those relationships with the team members of expertise uh, well in advance. Have the discussions and uh, reach out for education. Just because that's the way we've done it for the last several decades, doesn't mean it's the best way to do it now. And so continual reevaluation of those herd health programs is really important. Interesting stuff and very useful. I appreciate you being with us and thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week on Cow Calf Corner. We're here at the Purebred Center this morning talking livestock markets and Daryl, things seem to be struggling right now. What's going on? You know, the cattle markets are really struggling right now with a number of, of different factors. Uh, probably the main one right now in the fed cattle market is just the fact that we've got more cattle than we have packing capacity for right now. Um, you know, we've known for several years that packing capacity had declined to a point where it was, uh, you know, kind of limited. We've seen cattle numbers go up and, and right now we just have more cattle coming through feedlots than we can really process. So that's keeping a lid on these fed cattle prices uh, really for most of this year. And what kind of impact is uh, the feed market having? That's another big factor that's impacting cattle markets right now. We've had this tremendous run up in feed prices, um, particularly the feeder cattle markets. When you combine this sort of capped fed cattle market with uh, the higher feed prices, then that's really weighing on these feeder cattle markets. So, um, you know, all, all aspects of the, the cattle complex are, are struggling right now with those factors. And things have been pretty dry lately. How has the drought been affecting producers? 
The drought is another big issue that we're keeping an eye on. You know, it's been dry in parts of the country for much of a year. Other re regions have gotten dry more recently, but it's all really critical right now because we're going into the active growing season. And so we could see a lot of consequences going forward here with, you know, cow herds uh, being forced to liquidate, uh, feeder cattle, uh, summer grazing programs may not happen the way we plan. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a final factor that we're really keeping an eye on right now. Now that's a lot of doom and gloom it sounds like. Is there, is there any good news coming to the cattle markets? You know there, there is because these are all factors we're dealing with right now. We kind of knew that was going to happen. We knew the first half of the year was going to be a bit of a struggle. Um, you know these factors have intensified a little bit so maybe it takes us into the third quarter to get them cleaned up. But going forward beef demand is really strong. Um, you know, we're not able to capitalize on that right now in the cattle markets because of the, the capacity constraints, but it's there and, and we'll get to the point where that comes through. Export demand has been really strong. The latest export data was very positive. So once we get through these factors over the next few weeks or perhaps a, a, a few months, then, then we're going to have reason to, to have a lot more optimism in these cattle markets. All right, Daryl, thank you. Livestock marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Been a busy week for numbers in the ag industry, and Kim, the Wazzy report came out. What was in there? Well, you had uh, the final 20 numbers essentially for wheat, uh, close for corn and beans, and then the first estimates for the 2021 22 uh, year. You look at uh, wheat, I think it's relatively good news. Uh, it left still a lot of uncertainty in the market, but you look at all wheat production, the market was, was expecting. 1.877 billion bushels, it came out 1.872. So you wouldn't expect much change from that. Uh, of course, we had 1.82 billion bushels last year. Hard red winter wheat and for 20, we produced 659 million bushels, came out at 731 million for this year. Uh, the, the average guess prior to that was a 711, so not much change there. Uh, you look at the world, 28.5 billion bushels this year. They, the market was projecting 28.8. It came out at 29 even, so that was slightly bearish. U.S. ending stocks, 774 million for all wheat next year. The market was expecting 751. That's relatively close. 872, so we're looking at lower ending stocks next year. The world, 10 eighths what 20, uh, 20 is. 10.8 was what was expected for next year, and 10.8 is what we got for next year. With corn, you know, uh, the market was down seven cents. You look at uh, world production, 46.8 billion. It was 44.8, so a big increase in corn there. U.S. 15 billion bushels, 14.2 last year. The market was expecting 15, so you wouldn't expect much change in price, and you didn't get it there. You look at ending stocks, the world's projected to increase to 11.5 billion from 11.2. U.S. expected to go from uh, 1 billion 275 million, well, 1 billion 352 billion is what is it is for 2020, 1.5 billion. So higher ending stocks. And there you get a little bit of decline in corn prices. What does all that mean for the Oklahoma ag producers? Well, if you look at the Oklahoma ag producers, I think even if you know wheat prices are maybe higher than they should be, uh, we don't know that. I still think wheat prices will stay well above that uh, cost of production level, 550 to 575. Uh, I, so I think it's going to stay profitable for another year unless the world produces a lot more wheat than we expect. I think they've got good opportunity with corn and good opportunity with soybeans and probably still good opportunity with cotton. So I think for another year or so, I think producers are looking at some opportunity there. What they've got to worry about is increasing cost. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And before we wrap up the show this week, I want to take a couple of minutes to say thank you to all of the viewers of SUNUP over the past few years. Uh, 13 years for me, uh, I was brought back on or, or brought on to the show back in 2008 to help relaunch the show. And it was an honor to work then, just as it is an, an honor to work with the ag producers, the scientists, the researchers, the extension folk uh, throughout the state of Oklahoma who who really do epitomize the land grant system and to be just a small part of that over the past 13 years, I truly, truly appreciate it. And uh, I, I will forever be an advocate of the OSU Extension Service, the researchers, 
and all of the professionals here at Oklahoma State University. So before I head out, I do wanna say, be well, do good work, and keep in touch. And may I say, it's been a pleasure to work with you, Dave. I appreciate it. As we wind down today, we wanna to say a very sincere thank you to our colleague, Dave Deacon, for his 13 years of service to SUNUP and to OSU Agriculture. By doing what you love to do, Dave, you helped inform so many Oklahomans over the years. We wish you nothing but the best as you start your next chapter. From all of us at SUNUP and in OSU Ag Communications, we will miss you. Oklahoma is dry. Since November of 2010, the state has been under some type of drought designation, and the signs don't point to much relief in the near future. So if the droughts of the 1930s in our current one are so similar, why haven't we seen walls of dust sweeping across the Great Plains? Well, Jerry, it looks like, uh, looks like you got a little ice on your fence. You guys have been kind of hit with a lot of natural disasters yeah. here lately. I mean, you had, you had this go on right now, yeah. but earlier in the year you had fires. The Mesonet is celebrating 20 years of operation. That's 20 years of over a thousand atmospheric and subterranean observations sent back to the Norman office every five minutes. And this was about the original location of the plots. But the university thought that they should grow a building where they once grew crops, so they moved the plots about a mile west, which was not an easy undertaking back in 1947. Howdy, Tyler. How are you, sir? I'm well, how are you? Good. Good, good, good. So this is Tillman County wheat. Generations of Williams have actually farmed this Cimarron County land, which started with KB just after the Dust Bowl. I was graduated from high school in 37. And that's back there when we worried a lot about the dirt blowing if we didn't get the wheat to cover the ground, you know. When a seed is planted, harvest is the goal. It's only through love, protection from what the Oklahoma Panhandle can throw at it, and a little rain, that a seed of wheat can grow into something bigger than itself. And there you have it, a look at the Oklahoma wheat crop for the first week in June 2018. If there is something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.